15th of April, 1989, me and my friend Kevin were at an uneventful Arsenal versus Newcastle football match. As a kid, he used to drag me along to Arsenal matches and I used to drag him along to Chelsea matches. Bunking school, shoplifting and then reselling stolen items, the cost of a match ticket and a train fare would be found one way or another. My Chelsea back then had been relegated to the second division and were on a visit to Leicester, so it was my turn to watch Arsenal attempt to overturn Liverpool's ongoing dominance of English football, which, in my mind, seemed as omnipresent as Margaret Thatcher's reign over the United Kingdom. Little did we know that this was to be the season that the Davids of Arsenal finally slayed Liverpool's Goliath. But, by the end of the day, and certainly by the end of the season, that fact was overshadowed by events unfolding elsewhere. During the first half of the game, a voice over the loudspeaker informed us that Liverpool fans had caused a pitch invasion at Hillsborough in their FA Cup semi-final match against Nottingham Forest, which was being played at a neutral ground in Sheffield. The implication was clear, and doubtless fans up and down the country shared the sentiment. After a minute's confusion and digestion, in unison I joined the Arsenal fans in chanting We hate Scousers and You Dirty Northern Bastards. The narrative had already begun and we had become unwittingly complicit in pointing the finger at stupid, drunk and violent Liverpool football fans. Truth be told, many of us fans of other clubs were jealous of the long-standing Liverpool success story and the solidarity and passion of their fans, so we didn't need much encouragement. The same chants were repeated at half-time, but as news filtered through from one person to another in the crowd via those carrying portable radios, we realised that these were injuries which were not caused by hooligans fighting. From what I remember, the atmosphere for the remainder of that match was quite hollow. By the time the crowd had melted away, word had got round that what was going on was some kind of tragedy, and that people had been crushed. The odd thing was that even then it was hard for me to comprehend. Yes, I'd been in situations where I might easily be injured, but I could always move quickly enough to avoid harm. For example, when standing in the notorious Chelsea Shed End, sadly a bastion of racism particularly during the 70s and 80s, if our team scored, I knew I ran the risk of being squashed onto an iron frame when the crowd lurched forward. My trick was to duck underneath the frame. I'd also witnessed football hooliganism and been in situations where the crowd was so big you would be forced to give up the fantasy of being able to make independent decisions about which direction you were moving in. This could be particularly dangerous exiting a stadium where you'd have to manoeuvre yourself to avoid being herded into a frame or iron bar between the exit gates. But the idea of people actually dying was an alien one to me and to many others I suspect. It was all over the news in the following days. Dozens have been killed. Ninety-four of them. Innocents. Even children had perished. Fans had been crushed up against fences, stomped to death underfoot, suffocated in the middle of the crowd. Much of the scene was captured in graphic detail by the TV and print media. But even the television reports implied that drunk Liverpool fans were responsible. Rupert Murdoch's Sun newspaper ran a vicious campaign openly blaming Liverpool fans for hooliganism. They barely mentioned the policemen who stood there like statues watching people dying in front of their very eyes. They didn't seek institutional responsibility for what happened. To this day the Sun newspaper isn't available for purchase in many parts of Liverpool. From the perspective of a fan though, we thought we knew the score. If it was a crucial match and it was about to start, you pushed to get in. And sometimes, yes, you would travel to a match and hope to buy tickets from a ticket tout or some guy in the street. But if there were no tickets available and I had travelled hundreds of miles to watch my team in the semi-final of an FA Cup game, you can bet I would have pushed if I thought I could somehow scramble in. 
As fans, we had also witnessed drunken behaviour within football grounds. When the narrative of the crowd being responsible was spun, many fans felt this was part of the truth, and not just through tribal-like hatred of Liverpool fans. The public at large, already sick of the violence and racism of football grounds, also swallowed the official version. And who could blame them? English football hooliganism was a serious problem in that period. With the exception of occasional outpourings of solidarity towards the families of those killed, the Liverpool supporters stood on their own. Whatever the truth in my own mind, I had decided that it was unimportant. Yes, as an adolescent football fan, I hated Liverpool, but my feelings were of pity for the victims. The next season, I went up to Sheffield to watch Chelsea draw against Sheffield Wednesday. We stood in the terrace above the locked enclosure in the Leppings Lane end, where so many Liverpool fans had died. I caught myself staring down frequently during the match and remember exchanging glances with fellow Chelsea fans doing the same thing. Most of the flowers that had been laid on the terrace as a mark of respect the previous season had gone. The barren glare of concrete was stark. As was customary at the time, visiting fans would be forced to wait until most of the home fans had left the stadium. As we filed down towards the front of our enclosure, directly overlooking the terrace below, my own rather pathetic tribute was to drop spit onto the empty terrace some eight metres beneath us, not out of contempt, but as my own mark of respect for those that perished. It still felt unreal but I realised it could have been me. Today, after all these years, justice for the Hillsborough fans and their families has been achieved. The blame has finally and correctly been apportioned at the police, the media, politicians and the footballing authorities that allowed this to happen and then attempted a cowardly cover-up by blaming Liverpool fans. The Liverpool fans are launching a class action suit and will undoubtedly receive the compensation due to them. Not a time to celebrate, but a time to remember and to hope that this will allow the relatives of those that died the peace that they deserve. For me at least, to remember my own tiny but not insignificant role in watching this unfold and a chance to close this chapter and share my memory with you.